today we are going to voice our voices together as we read the word. Open your Bible. Ask your neighbor if they came with us. The book of Ruth. We are there. I said we read together, regardless of your versions. Uh, we are going to read Ruth chapter 1 and we look at verse 1 to 6, jump to verse 19 to 21. And so I'll guide so that we, are, we move together. So let's read verse 1. Number two. Verse three. Verse four. Verse 5, verse 6, there, verse 19, skip to verse 19. Verse 20. <laughs> 21. And that is the word of the Lord. Amen. You have spoken the word of God. May you take your seats. Uh, as I listened to you read the word of God, I started remembering my early years of school where the teachers would tell you read aloud and you're wondering why are some people reading faster than the others? <laughs> and uh, that's how different we are. I'm going to share on um, the, the, the sermon or the meditations that the Lord has laid in my heart. Is, would be entitled, and you can come up with your own title, Family Decisions That Bear Much Fruit. I know this is not the first time we have read the story of Ruth. I am sure many of us can narrate the story of Ruth as if she had been your neighbor, as if it's a person you are in school with, because it has been shared over and over again. I pray that today it will come to you differently. Lessons drawn from this book. The book of Ruth is very interesting. It's, it's, it's a small book of only four chapters that is placed between the book of Judges and the book of Samuel. Those of us who are good Bible readers and I'm trying to become, you get surprised that this book is immediately after Judges. And the, the word that begins there says, in the days when judges ruled. In the days when judges ruled. I asked the uh, first service and I'll still ask this service. How many judges do you know in Kenya? One judge you know? Eh, Maraga. If you don't know Maraga, then we need to help you. But all of us know Maraga at least, yeah? Even children know Maraga. Which other judge do you know? Joki Ndongo. If you know Maraga, you also know. <laughs> Depending on where you come from. But there's a time in this life, the Bible tells us, that the world, the land of Israel was ruled by judges. Can you imagine? If we are ruled by judges today. Maraga, Joki Ndongo, Mochelule. You know, those are the guys who are ruling us. There was such a time. And it comes 
The book of Judges, of course, comes after Joshua and declares tough things about his life because the children of Israel and become godless. They had abandoned the way that the Lord would have wanted. And then Ruth, that book comes just before Samuel is born. Because Samuel is the one who brings who? Prophets. Is it? Yes. It's Samuel who brings now prophets to rule. Judges disappear. I mean, brings kings, sorry. Samuel brings to us kings. So that book is there and therefore it is very central in our understanding. And so families must make decisions. We find a family here that, um, and to make a decision, this particular family led by a gentleman known as Elimelech and his wife and his sons, and to make a decision. This family, and to exit from Bethlehem, which means the house of bread, which was found in Judah, a place of praise, to go to another place where they had been told there was food. And that place where there was food, the Moab, the, at Moab, we are told they decided to go there because they needed food. Erimelech led his family. He made a decision to exit or to engage in some form of exodus from the love of God to a place where they would find the food. If you remember Wamboi, Wamboi, my friend, someone here, she brought the position of food in our lives to be very strange. Food, the position of food and the way it has led people to lose or to miss out on God's blessings. And so they go, that's what the book gives in a, in a snapshot. They go to live among the Moabites, a people who had rebelled against God and intermarried, and disaster strikes. Disaster strikes. And it always happens when people rebel from God, disaster waits them. And we are told Naomi later returns with our daughter Ruth. And Ruth becomes a very important person in our lives. I know every time this sermon is preached, many of us look at Ruth and listen to Ruth and marvel at Ruth. But there could never have been Ruth if Naomi was not in the picture. There could never have been. And so I want us to pay attention to this lady known as Naomi whose name means pleasant, led by a husband in times of difficulties. Many times, families will find themselves in very tough situations. And most of the times, not even just tough, even ordinary basic decisions, like my daughter wants to get married. You must make a decision. Your son wants to get married. Your child must go to school. Where to go to school is a decision that you must make as a family. And we have very many examples of men that lived on this earth that made decisions that we are beneficiaries of today. If you think about Abraham, for example, he led his family in making tough decisions. Remember, he decided to go alone and offer his son. And God, at one time before then, the Lord had commanded him, Genesis 12, verse 4, he had asked him, Abraham, move from this land where you live with your family to a land I'm going to show you. Every time I think of that and I imagine Abraham at our time, you come home and tell us we are moving. You must tell us where you are taking us. I mean, Agnes, you are told let's go. I would be shocked if you tell me you followed. Without asking, where? You are telling me God has told us that you are moving. Some young people here, like, come here, comes and tells mom, mom, me, I want to move. Me, nama. You ask, where are you going? Because moving is not easy. Abraham leads his family 
and he moves. And when he moves and his family follows, we know we are beneficiaries of his, of his promises. Joshua, in Joshua 24, 15, when he was talk, reminding the children of Israel where they had come from and how they had strayed and how they had betrayed God and left him, he makes a very tough decision. He, has remind, he reminded them how hard they were. And then he tells them ultimately that you serve whoever you want to serve. In the midst of these guys, he tells them, I will serve the Lord, I and my family. He made a decision. In the book of Samuel, chapter, chapter, 1 Samuel chapter 25, verse 13 to 18, that is a story worth reading. Maybe you can turn there just for a minute as we lay the context of the word that we share. 1 Samuel 25, it begins by saying this. Now Samuel died, and all Israel assembled, verse 1. Now Samuel died, and all Israel assembled, and mourned for him. And they buried him at his home in Ramah. Then David moved down into the desert of Moan. A certain man in Maon, who had property there at Camel, was very wealthy. He had a thousand goats and 3,000 sheep, which he was shelling in Carmel. His wife, his name was Nabal, and his wife's name was Abigail. She was an intelligent and beautiful woman, but her husband, a, 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 Cal, a Calebite, was, was surly and mean in his dealings. Some versions say that he was stupid, he was foolish in his dealings. <laughs> yeah? And so, if you read verse 4 all the way, David tells his servants, go to this man neighbor, because he's shearing a sheep and he's solitaring some, and ask him to give us some food. And this guy, if you turn to verse 10, you can read the conversation there. Nabal answered, David's servants, who is David? Who is this son of Jesse? Many servants are breaking away from their masters these days. Why should I take my bread and water and the meat I have slaughtered for my shearers and give to men coming from who knows where? Surely he was foolish, yeah? Oh, I couldn't even ask who is this David. So he just makes us kind of a decision. And now, David, of course, the Bible says there, he was a good man. He had not done any evil to the, he had not attacked them, nothing. So he refused. One of the servants in verse 14, one of the servants told neighbor's wife, Abigail, David had sent some people for food and her husband refused. And Abigail, being wise, beautiful, clever, smart, decided to take action. Verse 18, Abigail lost no time. She took 200 loaves of bread, two skins of wine, five, five dressed sheep, five sears and, and roasted grain, 100 cakes of raisins, and 200 cakes of pressed figs, and loaded them on donkeys. Then she told her servants, go. Ahead, I will follow you. But she not tell her husband, maybe. She made a decision in a very difficult circumstance. So whether you are a husband, whether you are a wife, whether you are a child in families, you will be required to make a decision. God expects us to make decisions. Some of the decisions oftentimes are serious, and almost all the times, especially for Christians, have serious spiritual implications. Whatever decision you make, even if you send a child to school, it would have a spiritual implication. There are some places you'll take them, they'll come back, Minus what you deposited in them. In actual fact, these decisions won't be made when families, most of the times, will be experiencing 
what has been referred to by great others, spiritual barrenness. Where there is no power of God manifest. I remember when, when, when I, we took our son, Mutuma, when we took him to, I took him to Aga Khan Academy, that time I was joining there, I was there as a teacher, one of our neighbors was very concerned. Why are you taking your son to an Islamic school? And she just told me, no, 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 no. My sister, you can't do that. Don't. You know what will happen when he goes there. And I, 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 I shared with her and I told her, you know, if Alan cannot stand for himself in a Muslim world, then that salvation is not working for him. If he cannot be able to use the word of God in such a setting, then what we have taught him is not working for him. It is useless. Because our, ch our children should be able to use that which you have deposited in them in very difficult circumstances. And at many times, I, that kept on ringing in my mind. That voice of caution from my loving sister kept on ringing in my mind. God requires us to make these decisions because he guides us. He is not merciless. He is merciful. When he puts you in a fix and he expects you to make a decision, he is there. He is there. He is present. How do we know he is present? In Psalms 103 verse 7, the Bible says, God made his ways known to Moses. He made his ways known to Moses and his did the children of Israel. Has God made any ways known to you? Has God made, does he make his ways known to you? Does he trust you enough to declare to you what is happening the next few minutes? I think we need to ask ourselves these tough questions because this word is ours. Genesis 18, verse 17, the Lord says, Shall I hide this from Abraham, what I'm about to do? Does God look at all of us here and ask, Shall I hide this from my son? Should I hide this from my daughter? You know, we are living at a time when we are getting surprised. And my friend, my neighbor, was telling me how she, she, she told me, you know, I looked at this girl of mine and I could see a baby coming. So she told me I was not surprised. Yeah. Does God really surprise? You know, sometimes... Those of us who are teachers know this. Eh? Josephine, you know. You know, parents come, you talk to them about their children, they are surprised. Oh, he can't do that, you know. Didn't God give you hints that this is happening in the life of your child? Is it always eaten? The Bible is telling us no. He doesn't hide what he's about to do. When we are faced with illnesses in our families, when we are faced with serious illnesses in our families, as brethren, we are so scared to say that it's just a, month, a number of hours my brother or my sister is going. We say to Meachia Mungu. Because we don't want to say the Lord has confirmed that this brother is resting. Not unasema to Meachia Mungu. Yet the Lord has actually given you peace within yourself that I'm resting your lovely brother or whatever. But we are not confident enough to say, God, like Abraham, did not hide this from me. I saw it because he doesn't. John 15, 15 is even more very close to us because Jesus says, John 15, 15, he says, no longer do I call you servants, but... Let's say that again. I no longer call you servants, but I call you who? Friends. 
Because everything I learned from my father, I have made known to you. So families need to make decisions, knowing very well that if we listen, if we listen, if we pay attention, God will not hide from you the reality of what it is that is ahead of you. God does not, you know, those surprise, surprise. I remember one time we were in a wedding where uh, uh, the pastor was telling the young man getting married, you don't, don't be doing surprise, surprise with your wife as you come with a Mercedes, surprise, surprise. Huh? And you are buying a Mercedes and you have no parking, you know? That's a surprise, surprise, darling, and you have no food in the house, you know? God does not surprise, surprise us. He speaks to us because he loves us. Of course, he's God, he can choose to surprise you. But then, it is within his will. And that will of yours, he must have put a desire in you. He is God. So it is important for us to acknowledge that because he's God, Isaiah tells us, his ways, his thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. He is in heaven. He declares, as, as, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways other, higher than your ways and your thoughts, my, my thoughts than your thoughts. So then, if that is the case, Elimelech's decision to move his family was within God's ways. It was not outside. The God dress of the pain and the misery. He was in God's way. He made a decision, moved his family, and it took ten, Naomi 10 years to make a decision to go back home. There's a song which says, I can hear my Savior calling. While they ended to Moab, God was still in the picture. And God was still doing some work. So I want to draw our attention this morning to Naomi specifically. We've done a lot about Ruth. But I want us to pay attention to Naomi. So the Bible, as the Bible that you read so very well tells us Man, Elimelech, his wife, named Naomi, which uh, that name means, I'm told it means pleasant one, the happy one, a makena too, so to speak. Naomi was just a happy lady. And the husband and two sons, and they move from Bethlehem. Trans, trans, translations tells us Bethlehem is the house of bread. And Judah is a place of praise. So Abimelech, I mean Elimelech, sorry, Elimelech tells his wife and son, let us go away from this place, which is called the place of bread, and there is no bread. Let us go away to Moab, where the descendants are from an ancestral relationship. You know, Moabs, Moabites are the descendants of Lot. They were born from Lot's daughters, having intoxicated, you know, the stuff that we hear, they're happening today, yeah? they're the same. L Lot's daughters intoxicate their father, sleep with their father, and Moabites. See, you are hearing these stories. So, this guy leaves Bethlehem, where Christ will later be born, and then go to Moab to dwell with the descendants of incestuous relationships. They left Bethlehem, where God dwelt, to a place where God, where, to a place and people which God considered rebellious. And what was driving them there is not because of anything else, but because there was famine. So when, she, when they are there, the Bible is so clear, she lost everything. What happens is that this man dies. 
the son dies after they have married. So Naomi finds herself with girls, three girls, childless, hopeless. The story goes on. The Bible tells us that these daughters, according to Naomi, didn't seem to add value in her life. She looked at them hanging around her, and they were not a source of encouragement. In actual fact, she encourages them to go away and find other people to marry them. She is depressed and bitter. Very interesting scenario there. Then she kissed them and then wept aloud and said to them, Will you go back? Will you? We, no, we will go back with you. Then Naomi verse 8 says, Naomi said to her two daughters, go back, each of you, to your mother's house. May the Lord show kindness to you as you have shown to your dead and to me. May the Lord grant each of you, may the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. And she looked at this girl, she only thought the only thing they need is another man. Period. Naomi was done. Her life was done. But what happens there after, brethren, is what I need us to pay attention to. That family, famine, were and stricken our family. I can tell you, because we are loved by God, famine will strike our families. Praise the Lord. Famine will come. It might be spiritual famine, it might be financial, it might be rebellion, it might be illness. Famine will strike. Please don't drive away the people who are with you. Tell them, go and find husbands elsewhere. They might just be the solution. They just might be the solution. Naomi looks at these girls and sees no value. And tells them, go away. But, as that is happening, God is at work. Naomi, interestingly, in verse 6, when she was still at Moab, and because her spirit was searching, when she heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, Naomi and her daughters-in-law prepared to return. When she heard that God was providing food now where? In Bethlehem, where she had left. She prepared to return. God comes to aid families when famine strikes. I'll say that again. God comes to aid families when, when famine strikes. Hey. God comes to aid families when famine strikes. You know what, brethren? When Naomi left and went to Moab, God remained in Bethlehem. Praise the Lord. When she left, God remained at work in Bethlehem. If, for adventure, you choose to live a fellowship. God does not live with you. God does not live with you. He, he remains in the fellowship of brethren. If you choose to be depressed here, God does not stop blessing his people. If you choose to form a pity party, oh, kwetu, magonjwa, oh, kwetu, death, oh, kwetu, God remains with his children. He will never 
leave his place. Interestingly, he will allow you to go. Like the prodigal boy, he will even pack for you food. You will go loaded. You will have enough to eat on the way. But he will not leave. Praise the Lord. The Bible says his eye looks to see who is yearning for him so that he can strengthen that person. While, while Naomi was being beaten by death, looking at his daughters, his eye, the eye of the Lord, was still upon her life. I don't know when you descended to move or whether you are deciding to move. I don't know whether it is from this or from another one. But even when you go, I don't know whether you have been, I lost a job one time, and I thought now that I've gone, God will strike that place dead. Wapi, he remains, he remains working because he's removing you. And you say, ah, you know, like, how say, God, they did a very good. When they go, they say, God, nothing, no. Because God, oh, how can I say this to ourselves? When you go, you go alone. When you go, you go alone. And be sure today, you are going because you are a friend of God. And he has told you, now it is time for you to go. All part, it was a time for her to go. We don't know anything about her ever again. She went, and she needed to go so that Naomi can be blessed. What do you do when God says, I remain helping my people? God remained in Bethlehem. Naomi's spirit was quickened to know, wait a minute, wait a minute, God is helping his people. Her spirit was quickened, the fact that God was at work, she had it. knowing that she had already lost everything. I am meant to believe, I'm persuaded, that Naomi, in the quietness of quietness, she was calling upon Jehovah God. And she was asking, what has happened? We have made decisions that have led us into trouble. Business deals that just the Lord just hit them and they disappeared. Our spirits are never in need of food. Physical food, no. Our spirits are craving for the spiritual food. Because the physical food has it got its function. And it fits us to just leave these bodies down here. But the spiritual food is for eternity. And Naomi wanted to go back to that spiritual food. She was yearning to be reconnected with Jehovah God. She was searching and the Lord had. I think that's not enough. After she realized that, she prepared herself and her daughter to go back. And Naomi, the Bible tells us, if you move on to verse, you move on to verse 11, but Naomi said, oh, now she's, verse 11, she's telling the daughters to go out because she wants them to go herself alone. Little did Naomi know that this God of us was also working in one of the daughters. Little did she know that this God was also functioning in the heart of Ruth. So when she tells the girls to go away and, and Ruth refuses, I, I get surprised at the fights that daughters and mothers-in-laws have. Serious, vicious fights. Yeah? I've fought a couple of them and I've won. <laughs> but they have left reminders in my heart. I won this one. The Lord helped me win this one. Fought tough battles with my mother-in-law. A lovely lady who serves the Lord. But we fought anyway regardless. And I was also a believer. We fought. Some of you might actually be at the thick of it. 
identify it properly. Because it is from that that you get out as a person who can be dependent upon and counted upon. You don't fight and just start tearing your old lady into pieces. And mothers-in-law who are here, remember, your daughter-in-law could actually be hanging around you because you serve God. And now you are fighting, throwing stones to her. And she still stays around your son. You know, she hangs around your son because there is a God in that family. So when you are sending them away, where are you sending them to go? You don't fit in our family. Eh? You know, I, I don't know. Maybe God is just, God is in heaven here on earth. And he, he just looks at us and just, I was telling the first service, and Angaria, you know? A foolishness like Professor Amo calls it. You know? Have you heard him talk about the thing? You know? You, you forget, you know, a foolishness that is so embedded in our hearts and in our mind that makes us behave as if we are on, at, at a stage acting. Eh? You are acting, you are abusing your daughter, you know, your daughter, you know, is abusing you. And you don't know. God has tied you together because in the two of you, there is hope for your family. That you can take my children, but you don't like me. You know? And may the Lord help us. What we are learning is that in this experience, Naomi plays a central place for us. And it's amazing how she handles it. So she pleads with the daughter, you know, the daughter, one of the daughters says, I won't, I will not go away. I'll stick with you. Verse, verse um, 19. So Ruth, of course, verse 18 tells us Ruth, uh, when 18 says, when Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. Me, yeah, I thank God for those mothers. When you realize she's not going away, Make her home and have party because I think it is good to just make her home and just don't go away. Just stay put. Stay there and because after all your husband is not chasing you away, the mother may have to change her mind along the way. So the two women went until they came back to Bethlehem, the house of bread. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was tied up because of them. And the women exclaimed, can this be Naomi? If I take my Lord, let him go back to your own town. You start after him. No, let's, let's, be, let's listen to God. That you go to your hometown and people notice you have even come and you are good. You didn't run away. When she went back, the village was tired. People paid attention. Some commentators say that Naomi, they were wealthy, they were known. Maybe they were very spiritual. Maybe they were very faithful servants of God. And the husband was a good man. He didn't want to wait for people to, his family to die of anger. So, you know, if there was food in Moab, God will sort us out there. So, Naomi comes back. The village is tied up. And they're asking, is this Naomi? And Naomi, you know what she says. What we all know is that she tells them, don't call me. Naomi, call me Mara. And she says, because, I want you to pay attention to what she tells them, verse 20. Because, part B, because the Almighty has made my life bitter. Who? Who has made our life bitter? So, person, why aren't we get the devil ourselves? Shetan, you know, Shetani, 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 you know, everywhere you hear Christians say Shetani. I mean, if I'm here. You 
It doesn't mean he doesn't. But what the Bible tells me is that he has to be allowed. He has to be allowed by God to touch you. Ruth does not, I mean, Naomi does not say, Shetani, and then he has made my life. My sisters and brothers, where do we begin giving the enemy credit? And especially women. Suppose it was God's will. So that he can seize on you and shape you so that we can enjoy your fellowship, my sister and brother. Eh? We can enjoy your company. Brother Muli, the Lord is taking you through a hard place. So that when you stand here, we actually can say, it is God. But many of us, Shetani, in the morning, Shetani at noon time, Shetani in the evening, Shetani all the time. You go to the place of work, you say, Hapa ni mekewa Shetani ni sumbue. Unaanza biashara you didn't sell uno leo si kuuza kwa sababu shetani alikuwa Na mu kuanza biashara na shetani When the Lord gave you children he didn't give you the children because the devil was there Naomi an amazing woman says Jehovah El Shaddai has dealt with me I pray that we have the courage when we walk out of the presence of God. When we come back, we say, the Lord, the Lord, alinitwanga. He dealt with my heart in the wilderness and brought me back to his fold because you are his child. When Naomi and her husband left, we were God's children. So today, should you, per adventure, should you decide to walk away, you are walking as a child of God. He walks with you and talks with you along the, along the life narrow way. That's what the choir tells us. Naomi presented a bitter cup into, the, into God. Naomi presented a bitter cup into which God was going to fill with his blessing. Or uh, say differently, Naomi comes back broken. Naomi came back broken. God expects you to be broken so that he can lift you up. If you come here, you are whole, complete, packaged. You might think it is your own doing. If you came here with no issue, you have enough money in your pocket... You are loaded. You know, you are heavy. You know, you have everything you need. Then possibly there is no space for a blessing. Your cup is, you have already made your cup overflow yourself. How I pray that the Lord will tip it over. He kicks it. He pours off. And then you come with it so that you can fill it. Because when the Lord fills it, it is full. When you fill it, it remains empty yourself. It remains empty. So Naomi comes back. I like what she does. She took action and returned to the spiritual spaces where she had vacated from. She comes back to Bethlehem. I'm told from Moab to Bethlehem, it's a ten, seven to ten days journey. Just picture this lady with this girl. And we were thinking allowed with the service in the morning, and we're asking ourselves, which, for example, assuming Nairobi is Bethlehem, where would you come from to take seven to ten days? Where? Meru? Eh? Marindi? <laughs> eh? Marindi? Elizabeth says Marindi. How far would it be? Just think about it. Eh? Kisi. We are going back to the place where the Lord is blessing his people. 
10 days. There must have been livers, there must have been, I, I guess, I am yet to visit that land, but I guess it was very dusty. And maybe they didn't have shoes. And there were women, I can imagine. Naomi said, I'm done with it. I don't know how far you are from Bethlehem. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how far you had gone. And it can be in any spiritual part of your life. How far are you from your prayer life? Are you in Meru coming to Bethlehem to be able to pray and the Lord hears? I don't know how far you are in as far as relationships with your people are concerned. But you are coming back to the Lord. So Naomi in verse 21, if you look at verse 21, She tells them in verse 20, don't call me Naomi. She told them, call me Mara because your mighty has made my life bitter. She says, I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has, has afflicted me. Your mighty has brought misfortunes um, in my life. I went away full. I went away full. I can assure you, brethren, every time we walk away from the presence of God or from the things of God, we go away full. You never go empty. Praise the Lord. If, if you, if you, even if you stop praying, you are full. Even if you stop tithing, you are full. That's why you refuse to stop. Yeah, that's why you refuse to tithe anyway. You had it. You refused. You refuse to serve. It doesn't mean you are empty. You are full. You don't want to serve. You are full, you know? Naomi says, I went away empty. I mean, I went away full. I had everything I needed. I was lacking nothing. And it's, we normally say, you don't know what you have until you lose it. You have children. There are some people who don't have. They might be rebellious, but you have. They might not be pleasing you, but you have. Wait until the Lord takes them away from you. Your scholars come and mourn with me. You have a husband, even if he's a drunkard, he is there. You might be the happy girl saying this foolish man, but he is your husband. You might just be the one who needs to turn to God completely and surrender. You have a job. Some of you say that the job in the morning I wake up and cast, I'll go to that office. You have it. You have a parent doesn't matter how she looks like or he looks like. You have a wife. It doesn't matter whether she's nagging or not. You have. You have. Please tell yourself I have something. The song says count your blessings. Some of us, it's the second shoe I need. But you already have one to be able to need another one. You already have one. If you didn't have one, you didn't desire a shoe. Because you wonder what are these people putting on their legs. You desire another dress because you have worn one. So the things that we desire, remember, brethren, is because we already had. And once we lose it, once we lose it, is when we realize, wait a minute, Naomi left. The food was already in bedroom. I always wonder, is it only the Arimelech family that was going to die? Huh? Yeah, yeah, all these other people who are here, Kwani, it is on, you know, but they left and lost. I like Naomi takes action and accepts that they walked away from the Lord. But the second part is what I would like us to pay attention to. 
but the Lord, who? But the Lord has brought me back empty. In fact, she saw God that she's, it is not her. Mimi si kwa mwani Rudy. You know those who go to America and tell you, ah, wana maisha huko nungumu have come back. No. As she says, it is the Lord who brought her back and this Lord brought her back empty without a husband, without children, with a daughter who she was not sure why she's hanging around her, and she had no home, came back empty. Naomi takes responsibility for her decision. I went away full, accepting that the Lord has brought her back. I don't know where you are at in your life. If you are in Moab, know the Lord is doing something with his people. Praise the Lord. If you have shifted from the presence of God, you have abandoned some things in your life, you have added other things, know the Lord. In Bethlehem, he is blessing his people. Know that even if you had left, the Lord is aware. That you left like the prodigal boy, thought you left full, thought you had everything that you needed, but he's telling you, come back empty, and I'm going to help you. As we come to close, if you look at Ruth chapter 4, it's amazing. When you live and come back, God is glorified. When you come back, God is glorified. Chapter 4, verse 14 to 17, it says that I thought, sorry, yes, here I am. Verse 14, sorry. The women who ended, who Naomi was telling, don't call me what? Now we call me Mara. The same group of women, because you know most of the times you'll be with the same, around the same people. There's a good group of women. They now started seeing God works in our life. In verse 14, it says, chapter 4, 14 says, the women said to Naomi, praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a kinsman redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. This is after the boy was born, yeah? He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you and is better to you than seven sons has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child, laid him on her, laid him on her laps and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son and they named him Obed. And the story continues. The story continues. When you come back, people will take note of your redemption. People will see you brighter. My husband always gives an example of a guy in the village who says he was giving them that even when a very dirty person becomes a Christian, they become clean. Eh? Sindio? In the village, wakiokoka, wanaanza kuoga, you know, nikama maja hiku hapo zamani. You know, physical things, yeah? They, they become brighter, they become happy, you know? People will take note of your redemption. And watasema ni udio ni mungu wa memtoa huyo. And they will give praise to God. You will never hear it, you may never know it, but it will happen. God will be glorified, like he was glorified in the life of Naomi. People will take notes. The fruit of redemption will affect generations, praise the Lord. Once you come back to the fold of God, you will not be there, Sister Jane. Because you are here, your grandchildren will carry forth this thing to generations. Sister Monica, they will be there, big, big multitudes, because you came to the knowledge of God. It does not matter what we see. Famine will still be in some houses, not in your house any longer. People, some people in Bethlehem continued with the famine. 
We don't know how many more went to Moab. But generations will be redeemed. The women said, may he become famous throughout Israel. Your generations will become famous because of your faith. Just like Naomi, your life won't be, your life won't be completely refreshed. In conclusion, I don't know your story. I know one thing. None of us is destined for destruction. None. Especially those of us who are seated in this place this morning. None. All of us are destined for eternity. But we have all fallen short of glory. Because we are in the flesh, we sin. And the Lord understands. Therefore, family decisions that bear much fruit are characterized by acknowledging that there is spiritual famine that will come in our homes. The hymn says, years have spent in vanity and pride. Secondly, being spiritually alert to know when the Lord is sending help is going to rescue you and your family. At last, my sins have learned. Take action. Confess. Come back empty. Praise and worship. Come and come back empty. Come back empty. Come back to the love of God. Come back. Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Now I've given to Jesus everything. Now I own him as my king. Like Naomi and the women, they will sing. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Are you there? And this morning you are saying, Lord, multiply your grace in my life. Lord, make your grace known to me this day. Do you want to walk in this grace? Do you want to walk in this place where mercy is great? Do you want to walk in this place where grace is free? Do you want to enjoy a pardon that is really multiplied for you in your life and your family as you decide what actions to take? Do you want to walk in liberty? Brothers and sisters, come. Come, and the pastor is going to pray with you. Come, and the Lord is going to minister to you. God bless you.